Hey everyone, I'm Mr. A, and today I want to talk with you about the quadrilateral family tree. So this is a way to organize the different quadrilaterals that we can talk about. A quadrilateral, of course, being just any shape with four sides. So up here is a general quadrilateral, not much about it other than having four sides. Now this tree breaks down the relationships between the basic quadrilaterals. There are some that we're not going to cover in this video, but in this video it will be enough to get you what you need to know for the basic uh, few shapes. So let's talk about what these arrows represent. These arrows represent additional conditions that we're imposing on our generic quadrilateral. So in the beginning we say, all right, if you want to be on this tree, part of this club, all you have to do is have four sides. Any quadrilateral has four sides, so that's all you got to do to be there. But then we impose a restriction on it and we say, okay, we're not interested in just any quadrilateral anymore. We only want quadrilaterals that have a pair of parallel sides. All right, so this is this first arrow, a pair of parallel sides. And if we do that, then we get shapes that look like this one over here, and that is called a trapezoid. Now, a little bit of interesting history on a trapezoid. Trapezoids in the U.S. used to be only one pair of parallel sides, and in the rest of the world it was one or more. And so now we've changed that in the U.S. So now in the U.S., if you've got a pair of parallel sides, you're a trapezoid, and we're perfectly happy with that. There's not a whole lot to talk about with the trapezoid. You do have some supplementary angles over here because these are parallel lines and that's a transversal. So those are same side interior. Other than that, not a whole lot interesting. So very quickly, we're going to move from the trapezoid and impose another pair of restrictions. We're going to impose a second pair of parallel sides. So if we do that, we're saying, okay, I don't just want any quadrilateral. And I don't just want any quadrilateral with a pair of parallel sides. We're saying that what we want is quadrilaterals with two pairs of parallel sides. And if we impose that restriction, now we're talking about something called a parallelogram. Now, a parallelogram is a really important quadrilateral. It's the first time we get a lot of interesting properties because we've imposed enough restrictions on this shape now to get all kinds of interesting things to happen. So what I'm going to do is first talk through the different properties of a parallelogram with you. Then we're going to prove them, and then we'll continue on with the rest of the family tree. So for a parallelogram, the most obvious property is that the opposite sides are parallel. So this is the definition of a parallelogram, right? It's a quadrilateral where both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. So if you have a parallelogram, certainly it's going to be true that the opposite sides are parallel. It's also true if you look at that shape, it might seem like the opposite sides are also congruent, and it turns out that that's the case. So we'll prove this in a little bit, but anytime you have a parallelogram, the opposite sides will necessarily be congruent. Something else you might notice about the symmetry of that picture is that the opposite angles look congruent, and that's also true. So these two angles here, opposite from each other, and these two angles here, are going to be congruent. So we've got three properties right there, and there's another three still coming for the parallelogram. So the other three, in no particular order, are that the diagonals, that is, if I draw both diagonals, bisect each other. If I put one diagonal into this shape, then that one diagonal will divide it into two congruent triangles. And finally, what we call consecutive angles in this shape are supplementary. So let's, let's pause on that one for a moment. Consecutive angles. So what does the word consecutive mean? Like one after another, right? So if I were to walk around this shape, starting at this angle, then if I go in this direction, the next angle I come to would be this one. In other words, that's one angle after another, right? So these angles would be called consecutive angles, and they're going to be supplementary. Same is true of these two angles. If I was continued around the shape, starting from this angle, this is the next angle I would get to. So that's another consecutive pair of angles, and they are supplementary. Same is true of these two angles, and the same is true of these two angles. Now, this is easy to see why it happens, because a parallelogram has parallel lines. So if you think of this line as being a transversal to these two parallel lines, well, then these are same side interior angles. And we already know, or you should have proven at this point in geometry, that same side interior angles are supplementary. So these two angles have to be supplementary. That makes these two angles also supplementary with this transversal. And then if you simply reverse the argument, look at, say, these two parallel lines, and then take this line as a transversal. Now you see that this angle and this angle are same side interior, 
and so they're supplementary, and the same is true of these top two angles. So consecutive angles are supplementary isn't really something we need to prove so much as just notice that consecutive angles are always a pair of same side interior angles, and since we know those to be supplementary, we can just take that property. So I don't need to worry about that one, and then there's another property here I also don't have to prove. I don't have to prove that the opposite sides are parallel. Think about why for a second. How did we get this shape? We got this shape by starting with a quadrilateral and asking for it to have not just one pair of parallel sides, but two pairs of parallel sides. So I don't need to prove that this shape has two pairs of parallel sides. That's the definition of a parallelogram. I got this by asking for quadrilaterals with both pairs of opposite sides parallel. So if that's the definition, I don't need to prove it's true. It's how we got the shape. These other four, however, I do need to prove. So opposite sides congruent, opposite angles congruent, diagonals bisect each other, and diagonal divides into two congruent triangles. So we're going to do this in two pieces, and I'm just going to kind of sketch these proofs out. We're not going to go crazy with a two-column proof here. So let's first tackle this idea about the diagonal dividing the parallelogram into two congruent triangles. So what I'm going to do is pick either diagonal. It doesn't make any difference. I'll just do that longer diagonal there. And just to kind of sketch out our thought, let's just say let's go ahead and construct that diagonal. So we'll construct DB. Now, when I do that, hopefully you'll notice that very quickly my parallelogram has turned into two triangles. So it's only for us to show now that those triangles are congruent. So what can we tell about those triangles? Well, hopefully you see really quick that we've got a reflexive right there, right? That diagonal that we constructed DB is, of course, congruent to itself. So we got DB congruent to itself. That's a reflexive piece. What else do we know about those triangles? What if I were to number these angles here, 1 and 2? Could you tell me anything about those two angles? Hopefully you see that those are alternate interior to this pair of lines on the top and bottom, right? The top and bottom sides of the parallelogram. Since we know that these lines are parallel, and that transversal forms angle 1 and 2 alternate interior, that tells us that those angles are congruent. So we also know that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. And I can make a similar argument if I were to come over here and say angle 3 and angle 4. Now those are also alternate interior, but to a different set of lines. Hopefully you can see that those are alternate interior to these double tick, right? these double arrow lines here, so the left and the right side of the shape. So we get angle 1 congruent to angle 2. We also get angle 3 congruent to angle 4. And again, just sketching out the proof there, I'm getting those from alternate interior angles. And now I see, if I look at these two triangles, what do I have? I got an angle, side, angle. So I've actually got those triangles congruent now. Triangle ABD is congruent to triangle. Now if I go ABD, then I'm going to start at CDB for the second triangle, right? So CDB. So those are congruent by angle, side, angle. And that's actually the first thing that we wanted to prove. Think about what we just did. We placed a diagonal into the parallelogram, and what did we get? Two congruent triangles. So there's this one right over here, right? The diagonal divides it into two congruent triangles. We just proved that property. But we're also poised to prove these two very quickly right now. So if you go back to our proof and think about what we have, now that these triangles are congruent, I can say, for example, that AB is congruent to DC. Think about why that's true. How do I know that AB is congruent to DC? Well, those are corresponding parts of my congruent triangles, aren't they? I can also say that AD is congruent to BC. So I've got AD congruent to BC. And that's both pairs of opposite sides congruent, right? So with that one pair of triangles, now I've got both pairs of opposite sides congruent. And uh, let's see, and that's from CPCTC, right? Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. What else can I say? Well, angle A and angle C are also congruent, aren't they? Simply by corresponding parts again. Those are simply corresponding parts of my triangles. And that's one pair of opposite angles in my parallelogram. So I've got them congruent. I still need D congruent to B. And when I say D, I mean the entire angle D, which is 4 and 2 together, and the entire angle B, 1 and 3 together. So that I can get, but it's not corresponding parts of congruent triangles. Uh, actually, let me not write D. That's a little bit sloppy. Let me write 
the three letters, angle ADC congruent to angle ABC. Right. So how do we know that? This one is just because of corresponding parts congruent triangles. Right. But how do we get the larger angles? Well, that's just by doing addition on the smaller angles. If you think about what we have here, 1 and 2 are the same angle, same size anyway, they're congruent. 3 and 4 are also congruent. So 1 plus 3 has to be the same as 2 plus 4. And so a little addition argument will get us that those larger angles, ADC and ABC, are congruent. So keeping track now, what have we got? We've got the definition, of course. We just proved that the opposite sides are congruent. We proved that the opposite angles are congruent. And we, let's see, still need to prove that the diagonals bisect each other, right? Consecutive angles are supplementary, we talked about before. We're not going to need to prove that one today because it comes from the parallel lines. But the diagonals bisecting each other, we still need to prove. Now, for that, we'll need a different picture. We need a picture with both diagonals in it. All right, so let me go ahead here and add both diagonals from DB and also from A to C. <clears throat> okay, so again, I will construct those diagonals. All right, so construct AC and DB. And notice when I do that, I get a bunch of different triangles in my picture. So what I want to do now is prove that some of those triangles are congruent. There's a lot of choices here, but what I want to do is focus on the top and the bottom triangles. So like these two right here. The left and the right would work just fine, but I think it's easier to see the top and the bottom. So let's start by noticing that we've got a pair of angles here, supplement uh, vertical angles, right? Um, I wanted those to be black. So I've got a pair of vertical angles, one and two, that are certainly congruent. So angle one is congruent to angle two by vertical angles. Right. What else do you know about those two triangles there besides the vertical angles? So think about our properties. Again, we still have these parallel lines. So if I were to number, say, angle three up here and angle four over here, would you see that those are alternate interior angles as they were last time? Okay. So we get angle three congruent to angle four, alternate interior. And then I need one more thing to get these triangles congruent. So what else do we know about these two triangles? Well, I'm going to claim that I know that AB is congruent to DC. How do I know that that's true? How do I know that this side is congruent to this side? Well, didn't we prove that a minute ago? On this page, didn't we prove that the opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent? So we can use that, right? That's now a pro something that we can use in a new proof. So this is true because opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. So that gives me these two triangles on the top and the bottom, right? So I have so triangle AB, oh, we didn't name this point. Let's go ahead and call that M. So triangle ABM is congruent to triangle. And if I say ABM, then I'm going to come down here and say CDM. And what type of triangle congruence is that? Angle, angle side this time, right? So by angle, angle side, triangle congruence. We've got those two triangles, which lets me say what? AM is congruent to MC, and DM is congruent to MB. Now, I get both of those by CPCTC, right? Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Why do I want to say that, though? Why do I want to say that AM is congruent to MC and DM is congruent to MB? Well, because if that's true, then what does that make M? That makes M the midpoint, right? So M is the midpoint of AC and DB, which means they bisect each other. And that was the last property of the parallelogram that we needed to prove. So going back to this page, I can check that one off the list. So we've proved all six properties of the parallelogram here. So I'm going to stop this video now. That'll be part one. In part two, I'm going to come back, talk about the rest of the quadrilateral family tree, and I'll do some examples with algebra, particularly for a rhombus.